Okay, we're recording. Go ahead. Thank you. Seeing a presence of a quorum, I am calling the November 3rd, 2022 regular meeting of the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council to order at 4.31 p.m. Uh, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapters 22 and 107 of the Acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Member of the public, members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. At this time, I'm going to call the roll of the committee to make sure we can hear everyone and they can hear us. So I'm going to start with, um, I'll go, go with Pat first since Shalini just logged on. President, present. <laughs> <laughs> she wants to be president too. <laughs> no, I don't. But I hope you'll introduce Elena at some point. I, I will. Um, Shalini? Present. Excellent. Mandy is present. Pam. Present. And Jennifer. Present. So we have our entire committee here. Um, the first order of on our agenda is a public hearing, and we have to do that first. Um, but before I get into that public hearing, um, I, I want to say welcome to Elena Tomescu. Um, we will not probably reach your part of the agenda, Elena, for like another hour. So you feel free to turn off your video and kind of pay attention. We'll make sure we have to do a public hearing first. <laughs> but Elena is one of the uh, is a UMass student who helped Shalini um, work on the summary and the reporting out and um, that was in the packet regarding all of the surveys that we re have received responses to. So she was here today to help answer any questions. And I want to just say a big thank, thank you. you to her. Thank you I'll say it much. again when we get there. Um, but we're thrilled that you could join us today to help um, explain the work and all of that too. But feel free to take like an hour long break or so <laughs> before we get to your part. <laughs> thank you guys for having me. Um, with that, we're going to start our hearing, um, and so I need to go through that public, that that sort of stuff too. So, it is now 4.33 p.m., and in accordance with the provisions of MGL Chapter 40A, this public hearing of the Community Resources Committee of the Amherst Town Council has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted, and the hearing is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested residents to be heard regarding the following proposed amendment to the zoning or amendments to the zoning bylaw. Pardon me while I read the very long paragraph. Zoning bylaw food and drink establishments, Article 3 use regulations, Article 5 accessory uses, Article 11 administration and enforcement, and Article 12 definitions. To see if the town will vote to amend Article 3 use regulations to delete existing use categories in Section 3.352.0 Class 1 restaurant, cafe, lunchroom, cafeteria, or similar place, Section 3.352.1 Class 2 restaurant or bar, and Section 3.352.2 Class 3 drive up restaurant, and to add the following use categories Sections 3.352.0 Restaurant, cafe, bar with food, or other similar food beverage establishment where food is available at all times, section 3.352.1 bar with no food served, section 3.352.2 nightclub, and section 3.352.3 any of the above food and drink establishments with occupant capacity of more than 250 occupants, and to add standards and conditions for these uses, and to amend article 5 accessory uses sections 5.041, 5.042 and 5.043 to allow seasonal outdoor dining as an accessory use to a principal use authorized by section 3.3 to allow outdoor furnishings associated with such use to remain in place between November 1 and April 1 as long as the use is active and operational to remove the prohibition on outdoor heating and cooling devices and to allow live or pre-recorded entertainment as an accessory use to a principal use authorized by section 3.3 and to delete reference to drive-in restaurants. 
and to amend Article 11, Administration and Enforcement, to rearrange the paragraphs describing when site plan review is not required, and to clarify the requ requirements and process for granted administrative approval, and to amend Article 12, Definitions, by clarifying Section 12.05, Bar, and by deleting Section 12.11, drive up restaurant and any associated renumbering that may be necessary. Whew. Okay. <laughs> Last night at the planning board, Doug Marshall said that was the longest sentence he'd ever read. <laughs> it's a long one. So that is the hearing that is opened. As I said, it opened at 4.33 p.m., even though it took me three minutes to get through all of that. Um, we will be running this public hearing as we run every public hearing. We will start with disclosures of committee members and then we'll move to the presentation by the planning staff. And then we'll have questions from the committee and then questions from the public and then public comment on the proposal and then any response from the planning staff and then further questions from the board or committee. I do hmm. want to say um, that at last night's planning board meeting, um, the planning board opened their hearing on this matter um, and held a lengthy discussion. They did not make a recommendation nor close their hearing last night, and they continued their hearing until November 16th. Hmm. Um, so with that, do any committee members need to make any disclosures? Seeing none, we're going to move to the planning staff presentation. I believe Nate is doing that. For those in the audience, we currently have two attendees. Um, in case they are interested, uh, we will be doing food and drinks probably for an hour is sort of my estimate, but that's just an estimate. And then we will be moving on to the rest of our agenda. Um, okay, so Pam, before we go to Nate. Great, thank you. Uh, it would be very helpful, I think, for the rest of you if Nate and or Christine could describe a little bit why the why the the hearing didn't close last night and why there were um, um, why there's a continued conversation about it. Thank you. Thank you. So if you could do that as part of your presentation, Nate or Chris, that would be great. So Nate or Chris. Why doesn't Nate take it away? And if he misses anything, I'll fill in. OK. Sure, thanks everyone. Uh, Nate Malloy, a planner with the town. I'll share my screen. I have a presentation and then I'll walk through the sections of the bylaw. And so, you know, the CRC had seen this previously and there's been some slight changes. Um, and there may be some more depending on comments. <clears throat> uh, let's do, we'll start here. Um, if the screen's visible for everyone. May I just say one thing? Note. May I just say one thing, which is that the town council referred this to the CRC and the planning department and planning board on October 3rd. I just wanted to put that out there because it was not completely clear at the planning board meeting last night that that had occurred. Thank you. So this is the presentation uh, that was given to the planning board last night. So we're really calling this um, updating the food and drink establishment uh, section in the zoning bylaw. It had been previously Article 14, but that was a bit of a misnomer. Uh, the background is that planning staff had thought about changing uh, food and drink classifications prior to the pandemic. And then with the pandemic, um, you know, we realized that we, we had the capacity and the ability to issue conditions and manage it uh, both administratively and through permitting. And so some of it was to capture the uses we're actually seeing being applied for. Um, and now we have 20 years of standards and conditions that we can place in the bylaw. Uh, additionally, the, you know, the Community Resources Committee and the Amherst Business Community had asked that parts of Article 14 uh, that were used during the pandemic be made permanent. And some of that was administrative approval for minor changes, and also just having what seemed to be a more encouraging environment around businesses, uh, business approval and working with businesses. The purpose and goals, and so, you know, in 2001, the current classifications were added, and that was an update on, um, you know, what had been in place for almost 30 years. And so I see this as another update, right? So it's, we have 20 years of experience using the current bylaw, and really we'd like to update it with new classifications. Uh, we can clarify the, the permitting process while doing that, um, improve the standards and conditions. We can apply lessons from Article 14. Um, and some of that is, you know, trying to encourage businesses to stay and expand and attract new businesses. 
It's really also with um, Article 11, it's strengthening the administrative approval process that's already in place and happening. And through Article 14, we realize that we can, we can actually have uh, conditions and plans submitted through administrative approval. And just a, a quick uh, run through of what Article 14 has done. Um, it's permitted the opening of a few restaurants and expansions. So the spoke uh, doubled in space. It, it you know, now occupies this whole building. So it, it you know, moved from one side to the other or combined sides. Garcia's opened with Article 14 as did Mexicolito and the Drake. And so when these were permitted administratively, you know, there was plans submitted, there was a management plan by the applicant, and then there was a decision uh, written by the building commissioner that's recorded with the town. And so that was new with Article 14, and we realized it's nice to have this written record, uh, and we can require plans even if things are administratively approved, as opposed to just having you know, an email or something saying, yes, we can formalize this. And so that's what we're, we're proposing with the Article 11 changes. Um, where this applies, it's five zoning districts throughout town. Um, you know, it's what's shown here in the pink, red, or the cross hatching. It's in, uh, uh, you know, downtown in the BG and limited business. So general business and limited business. It's in the neighborhood business, the commercial, uh, and the business village center. And so where, you know, where it currently applies and where it would apply would be just these areas. Um, just to reference that the, in the neighborhood business, there's about six properties and it's right around, you know, near the depot on Main Street, near Dickinson and Triangle Street. And it's, you know, it's a very small uh, district, whereas, you know, commercial in North Amherst is much bigger. A, a comparison of what we have and what we're proposing. So currently there's three use classifications for food and drink establishments, class one, two, and three. And so class one is a restaurant, cafe, lunchroom, cafeteria, or a similar place. It closes before 1130. Um, that's site plan review. So it's a buy right use uh, through the planning board and uh, administrative approval. And administrative approval happens when uh, there's already been a site plan review for that use. And then something, you know, there could be a new restaurant coming in or some minor changes that don't change the exterior very much and the building commissioner can approve it administratively. And so that's been in the bylaw um, for a while now. Class two is a restaurant or bar that's open after 1130. That's by special permit. And then a drive up restaurant is also by special permit. Um, there's some other categories, uh, conditions in the bylaw in terms of distance from residential uh, and the, the serving of alcohol um, that triggers class one or class two. Um, what we're proposing, though, is you know four four categories. So a restaurant, cafe, a bar with food, or other similar food and beverage establishment. So a bar with food is a bar with a kitchen. So like the Monkey Bar is um, a restaurant; it's also a bar. A bar with no food is the next category, and so the Moan and Dove or something that doesn't have a kitchen. You know, it can serve prepackaged food or you know pretzels or peanuts, but that's that's not considered food. That's, that's a bar with food and that's by special permit. There's a nightclub and then an establishment with occupancy of more than 250, um, that's a occupant load. So that's both staff and anyone in the restaurant. So that's not seating, it's the total occupant capacity based on code. And so, you know, that's, that's everyone in a, in a space. <clears throat> Just some examples of how current restaurants would fall under the proposal. Um, you know, Johnny's Tavern, El Comolito, Pita Pockets, and House of Teriyaki would be considered um, that first use, a restaurant, cafe, or bar with food, and they'd be site plan review. Uh, what's also shown is their occupant capacity. So Johnny's is fairly large at 174. Uh, this is both indoor and outdoor. So when it's the occupant capacity, it's staff, it's also indoor and outdoor uh, dining and seating. Um, and you can see the rest of them are, are a, bit, a bit smaller. Um, a bar with no food is Moan and Dove. So that would still be um, a special permit process. Uh, there is a nightclub or two in Amherst. One is Hazel's Blue Lagoon, and that's um, you know a special permit. <clears throat> there is a definition in the state building code for nightclub. It's an area that has you know fewer seats than capacity, loud music, dim lighting, and I don't you know, there's some other conditions. And so you know, in, uh, in the use chart, we're saying parenthetically, the nightclub as defined by state building code. Um, so it's not, you know, we're not making up a definition. And then uh, we have this fourth category, any establishment with more than 250 
uh, occupant capacity. And so, you know, the hangar is an example with almost 400. There's not many in Amherst that are this large. And so one of the discussions last night was, is 250 the right size? You know, could it be smaller? Could it be 200 or 175? And, you know, I recommended and staff recommended 200. Uh, the planning board had asked if 175 would work. <clears throat> the difficulty is that there's probably a number of establishments that are between 175 and 200 now that really would be a site plan review use. And if you dropped it to um, 175, they would all of a sudden become a special permit use uh, for no other reason than that they have an existing occupant capacity of more than that threshold we determined. Um, and so the restaurants that have been operating um, just fine. And so, you know, staff thinks 200 could be a threshold to use. Uh, you know, with the recommended changes to the, the use chart to those establishments, um, classifications, there's changes, associated changes in Article 5, accessory uses. Um, like I said, we're trying to strengthen Article 11, administrative approval, and then there's minor changes to definitions in Article 12. And I'll just walk through those sections. Um, ironically, Article 11 could almost be a standalone change. It's not just for restaurants, it's, you know, administrative approval for any use. Just to clarify that uh, when we discuss it. Um, and just to show you the use chart. So currently in 3.352, there's the three classifications, class one, class two, and class three. What's shown is that essentially all of this would be removed. It's in red and strike through. What would remain is this condition in the BN that uh, an establishment have no more than 30 seats, indoor and outdoor, that serving alcohol would close at 9 p.m and that any wall of an establishment couldn't be located more than 100 feet from a residential use in a residential district. And so we're proposing that that condition remain in the BN uh, zoning area. And essentially that limits, you know, the BN district to about just, you know, two properties that could actually have a restaurant. Um, you know, when the BN was, was developed, they put these, these kind of prote protections in and we're proposing to keep that. So what's being proposed is um, a whole new section 3.352 with the proposed four uses, um, a restaurant, cafe, bar with food or other similar food and establishment uh, where food is served at all times. So, um, and then there's a bar with no food served. <clears throat> and so the monkey bar is an example I mentioned that is a restaurant um, for most of its operation, but then later in the evening, it becomes a bar with no food. And so what would happen in that instance, it would actually have to apply for two permits. It would have to apply for a special permit and a site plan review to operate as both a restaurant or a bar with food and then a bar with no food. Um, what you can see here is, you know, in the zoning districts, you know, we have site plan review or a special permit. So, uh, you know, we're just, we're, you know, we have, you know, that one classification is site plan review across the five zoning districts. So then there's a bar with food, nightclub. Um, what's in blue was what's added parenthetically. Um, since the last time this was presented to both the CRC and planning board. So now it says as defined by the state building code and then a larger establishment. Um, but we have here in, in the next section, these applicable, um, if applicable, these standards and conditions, this is what you know, we've staff has developed over the last 20 years administering the bylaw is the zoning board typically approves every request for a class two restaurant and they've developed, you know, kind of a boilerplate of standards and conditions. And so what, what these 10 things do here is get staff to be able to, and the boards to be able to issue those conditions. So anytime someone's applying for these uses, whether it becomes administratively approved or to the planning board or zoning board, they need to submit information to these 10 conditions. So, you know, they have to be reviewed, reviewed and approved by the board of licensing commissioners, if applicable, uh, other local state codes and regulations. So Board of Health is a really big one if you're having a kitchen. Accessory uses of seasonal outdoor dining, live or pre-recorded music or drive through facilities is regulated in Article 5, which we've um, proposed to update to accommodate some of these, these changes. And you know the next few are really important that the establishment shall operate and be maintained in accordance with an approved site plan, floor plan, a layout plan with occupant capacity, for indoor and outdoor, a patron management plan, um, a general management plan, a parking management plan, and traffic impact statement. So anytime someone is proposing a restaurant, even if it's replacing an existing restaurant, we would ask for all this information. 
Uh, we're saying that the management plan has to include hours of operation, trash and refuse storage, describing you know, how often it would be picked up, outdoor dining, queuing, signage, lighting, deliveries, noise containment, and response to noise complaints. Uh, what's been added is strategies to screen or buffer adjacent properties, uh, employing, employee parking and other requested information. And so last night there was some discussion about, you know, we no longer have this um, 1130 threshold in terms of closure. And so is that really important to protect um, residential neighborhoods? And, you know, staff has said that what we've learned since 2001 is that with the right conditions on a permit, we can manage that um, without necessarily having a special permit. So it could be a site plan or view use. And if we require all these things up front, including a management plan, we have enforcement actions and we have strategies that the applicant has already listed as to how they would manage that. And so then we can enforce it. <clears throat> but there's some discussion about, you know, if there needs to be some more language written into what would be included in the management plan for, um, you know, for protection of existing neighborhoods or residential uses after a certain hour. And so, you know, the planning board was discussing whether or not they'd want to see certain changes, um, you know, additions to some of these requirements. Uh, moving on, you know, electronic ID verification, if, if you're serving alcohol, um, on-site training and certifications, including crowd control and tips, uh, you, reusable tableware shall be used for outdoor uh, table service. Uh, it says all areas to be cleaned daily and left in a clean condition by the end of normal business hours. Uh, outdoor furniture shall be placed to meet clearance services and egress requirements. And then we've kept this uh, BN district um, condition, <clears throat> removing the class one. So any, any use in the BN would have to meet these. Um, so this was, you know, the proposed use chart. Um, in terms of accessory uses, what we're proposing is uh, to three sections. It's the seasonal outdoor dining, 5.401, that uh, in these districts, the BG, BL, BVC, BN, and COM, that uh, season outdoor dining, including sidewalk, sidewalk cafes, courtyard, or terrace dining, can be accessory to a principal use uh, in section three and subject to the same review. So that means any use in table three could have a, a outdoor dining as an accessory use. You know, currently it's what's in red here, only if it's accessory to a restaurant, cafe, lunchroom, or cafeteria, to a bakery, deli, or other similar establishment, or to a retail store. Um, and we're saying that it could be to any, um, any use. The, the thing here is, you know, um, to serve food or outdoor dining, you do need a commercial kitchen. It's a big expense. You have different licensing and inspection requirements. And so, although we are now saying it could be accessory to certain uses that wouldn't, couldn't offer it now, um, you know, staff doesn't think that we're gonna have, you know, a retail store putting in a kitchen just to have outdoor dining. Uh, elsewhere in Article 5, it also says that accessory uses need to be um, common in the region and in the county and associated with the business. And so if it really seems like the use is not accessory at all to the primary use, the principal use, and it's a secondary principal use, then it's actually not considered accessory. So the definition of accessory does protect, you know, um, say like a, you know, a gas station from having outdoor dining. A gas station may have indoor uh, seating, you know, sometimes gas stations and, um, you know, Dunkin' Donuts are combined, but outdoor dining on the sidewalk may not really be an appropriate accessory use to a gas station. In, uh, in the subsections of this, um, right now we're saying that any structure, framework, or planter for outdoor dining can be there so long as the accessory use is active and operational and we're removing between November and April 1. So the way it's currently worded is that you can have outdoor dining, except that it has to be closed as of November. And we're saying essentially leave that, um, it could be remain open year round as long as it's being used. So if a restaurant wants to stay open through through December and have outdoor dining, um, you know, this change is making that possible. In 5.0413, we're removing the statement that no, no such facility shall be equipped with freestanding heating or cooling devices or served by HVAC from an adjacent or associated building. And so, you know, during the pandemic, we allowed outdoor gas heaters and they worked really well. So, you know, to go along with the changes in the previous section, we're delete, you know, proposing to remove this, delete this. 
for live and pre-recorded music, uh, similar to the outdoor dining, we're saying that it can be accessory to any principal use in section three, not just a restaurant bar in or bed and breakfast. So we're saying that, you know, live or pre-recorded music or entertainment uh, could be an accessory use to, you know, different uses, not just, you know, those five that are currently listed. And there are conditions here. So, you know, these are, everything else is existing in, in Article 5. So, you know, there's a decibel uh, measurement on the property boundary in terms of how loud it can be. Um, you know, it has to be clearly accessory and incidental to the principal use. Uh, and then, you know, there's additional requirements here. So, you know, what we're saying is that it can be allowed um, through the same permitting mechanism as the, as the principal use. So if the principal use is a special permit, this accessory use would be special permit. And so it's not as if it would happen by right, it would still, there'd still be a permitting mechanism. And in terms of a drive-through facility, we're just removing a drive-in restaurant because we're proposing to no longer have that as a, as a use category. So a drive-through facility is still allowed as an accessory structure. Um, you know, it can be used, you know, for instance, at a bank or car washes or other things, but we're saying it's not really, there's no longer a drive-in restaurant. So those are the changes to the accessory use uh, sections. Uh, I'll move on to Article 11, which is administration and enforcement. And this is where you know, there's site plan review criteria. And currently there is this applicability section and we're proposing to add what's in bold italics. So we're changing it to administration and applicability. And we're, we're kind of reorganizing uh, this section. Uh, we're saying 11.211. Um, Site plan review shall not be required when there's these four, four categories. And as you can see, there's some red and there's some existing um, black text. So these are already in the bylaw in terms of when site plan review isn't required. We're just reorganizing them. So when there's no physical change to the exterior of a building or site, there's no site plan review. When the only change is um, the installation of signs in compliance with Article 8 of the bylaw. Um, when a change of use is proposed and there's no physical changes uh, and the building commissioner determines the change will not conflict with the purpose of the bylaw and finds that the proposed use will not result in need for further review under 11.243. Uh, additionally, site plan review would not be, re be required if there's minor alterations to a building or site. Uh, and the building commissioner can authorize the work to proceed um, following these, these conditions that are now been you know, uh, lettered A, B, C, D, E. So all this is currently in the bylaw. We're just reorganizing it. So we're not adding to when site plan review is not required. We're just, um, we think it's a better organization. What we are adding is this administrative approval in instances where site plan review is not required. And so this is what's new uh, and proposed. So currently there really isn't a strong administrative review process. Right now we're saying that um, this is where, you know, what's in article 14 essentially that no work shall commence until the building commissioner has authorized the work or the use to proceed. Uh, the building commissioner may approve, approve with conditions or deny the proposal. Decisions shall be made in writing, filed with the town clerk and kept on record uh, within the conservation and development department. The building commissioner in consultation with the planning director shall be authorized to apply any design review criteria found in Article 3, Section 3.204, Design Review Principles and Standards. And so this, you know, this is a, um, a change that empowers the building commissioner position to you know, deny an administrative use. And so we see it as really important. So we'd still ask an applicant to submit those conditions back in Article 3, you know, site plan, a floor plan, occupant capacities, uh, any sign plans, and the building commissioner could um, approve it, deny it, or approve with conditions. And so what happened in Article 14 is we'd ask a, a restaurant to submit all that information and then there'd be a written decision with anywhere from 15 to 25 conditions that would then apply to the use. And so, um, you know, we're proposing to keep that. And, and <clears throat> what, this is important because if there's an existing restaurant that has a site plan review use or permit, say it was permitted two years ago and a new restaurant comes in and they're not proposing to make any changes to the exterior, uh, except for the signs, then according to Article 11, which is existing, they don't need site plan review. It goes right to administrative approval. And um, with these proposed changes, we're saying the building commissioner could, 
could deny that and say, no, you know, um, perhaps, you know, the intensity of the use, the hours of operation, something is, is too, there's too much of a change. Um, it could always go then to, you know, to a board for review. Um, we are saying that the building commissioner has the ability to seek guidance from the DRB or historical commission. And then it could also, um, you know, then become a site plan review. Um, but so, you know, currently the planning board hasn't seen a lot of restaurants because of this, you know, so an existing restaurant has a site plan review permit, which still guides it. Five years later, the restaurant changes hands or something changes about it and it doesn't actually get to a hearing and it goes to administrative approval. Um, that's not new, that's not a new process. Um, so last night there was some discussion saying, well, if we're changing the use categories and 1130, you know, is in a threshold for, um, you know, between site plan review and special permit, then restaurants that could stay open later would essentially then become um, approved administratively and not have a hearing. So, you know, neighbors wouldn't, or abutters wouldn't be noticed. And, you know, is that problematic? And, you know, my response would be that those standards and conditions we're including in the bylaw are enough to provide conditions and mitigation measures, uh, you know, if, if that was administratively approved. Um, it's also that existing permits on restaurants are still in place. So even if the bylaw is changed and something has a special permit now, and although it could be a site plan review use in the future, the special permit that it has is still a guiding permit. It's still valid and legal. And so until that special permit has, is changed, which may not happen for years, it's still operating under that special permit. And so it's not as if every restaurant or bar is gonna all of a sudden become site plan review, it would be if there were changes. Um, and then that initial change would actually be a hearing. It would be a, you know, a site plan review hearing um, uh, if, you know, if that were to change. And so that's Article 11. Article 12, just quickly, um, we, we changed, uh, there's a definition for bar. So really a bar is a, an establishment where the service and consumption of alcoholic beverages is the uh, primary use and food may be incidental. Um, we just add a slight change there. Uh, we are deleting a drive-up restaurant um, in part because we, this, it was never really used. And so, you know, we have a drive-through facility, which is allowed as an accessory use. And what we're saying is a drive-up restaurant would just be a restaurant. There's really, um, you know, it, this, this actually was, this was never really put in place. Uh, and, uh, and then, you know, there's renumbering um, as uh, I think that was in the legal ad. So if we wanted to renumber, or, you know, there's one suggestion last time to say intentionally left blank here so that the rest of the Article 12 wouldn't have to be renumbered. And so there's no other changes. There's an existing definition for restaurant, uh, and that remains the same. And I guess I can stop there and take any questions. Thank you. Yeah. Um, does any of our committee members have any questions on that extensive summary of what is being proposed. Thank you so much for doing that, Nate, and for weaving into that where the planning board was asking questions and all that's that was also very helpful. Um, questions from the committee. Pam. I was trying to let other people go first. Um, I do, I do have some additional questions. I emailed uh, to Christine and Nate and Rob, uh, I guess last night after their meeting or during their meeting, uh, some of my questions. And um, I think um, I'm very, very glad to see the, the pretty extensive list of standard conditions. Um, I think I would like to add service of alcohol to that list. It's already quite extensive. Maybe it's included in the management plan already, but it's not listed there. I think that's one of the key elements that differentiates what today is a class one and a class two. That's one of the differentiations. Um, I'm I'm a little well. Let me let me ask some of my other questions first. Um, Question for for any of you: Why why is it that that today's class one uh, facilities seem to be able to convert so quickly to a class two 
when um, when that implies that their hours of operation um, are are lengthened and service of alcohol may be added. Why why is that so easy and why do they do it so frequently? Uh, should I answer now or yes, please? Uh, I'd love yeah. to. Yeah, so what you know, Rob Moore has said, and what's what what happens in practice is a restaurant will come in as a class one because it's a site plan review, so it's a buy right use, and they'll meet all the conditions of a class one. They'll you know get the permit, they'll invest in the space, and then a few months later they'll apply for a class two. And so really, you know, unless there's been a lot of complaints or issues with how it's been managed or operated, you know, the permit for a class two is 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 granted pretty easily because the only change would be the service of alcohol and hours of operation. And so from the zoning board of approval standpoint, there's been no reason to deny that, right? So they can put conditions on in terms of when there's queuing, how are you gonna manage queuing on the sidewalk? How are you gonna manage crowd control and noises? And so there's enough conditions put on the permit that there's really no reason to deny it. And so, you know, we don't wanna say it's gaming the system, but you know, what we found is that those those thresholds that were put in in 2001, you know, the 1130, the service of alcohol and certain things were, worked in 2001 because previously for the last 30 years, there was nothing in the bylaw really that had those protections. And what we've learned since, you know, in 20 years is that we can, um, you know, with standards and conditions, we can approve this site through site plan review and still have the same protections that are offered that are, you know, happening now that were, you know, put in place in 2001. And so, Okay, so 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 adding specifically adding service of alcohol to that management plan list would be very helpful then, because mm -hmm. that's the key. You already have hours of operation, which is the other the other primary factor. Um, given given that list, uh, back to the the management plan, the site plan, the floor plan, the layout plan, et cetera. By the time they work through all of those plans, I'm I'm really curious, why does it take that much longer to go to the ZBA or the planning board um, for a permit after after all that work? Well, I think it's <clears throat> I think it's it's two things. One is a special permit is discretionary, and so even if we say that Amherst grants a lot of its special permits, uh, many communities do not, and so businesses will actually not come to Amherst just because it's a special permit use, right? They'll call the town or they won't even, you know, they might get as far as a call to the building commissioner or to myself or even Gabrielle or Jennifer Mullins. And if they see that it's a special permit use, they just don't even bother. Um, you know, even if we tell them that we'll work with them or that, you know, they can manage this, a special permit is really not um, seen as a, you know, it's not an incentive really. And so even, you know, it's, it's not just for restaurants, it's for anything, right? Even when an appraiser is doing appraisal on a property and they see that, oh, you could put a development on it, but, but it's by a special permit, you can't appraise <laughs> the property based on a special permit use. It has to be a by right use. And so it's just the nature of what a special permit, kind of the, you know, the, the stick, I don't want to say the stigma of it, but what, you know, what, what it really is. It's a discretionary permit. Got it. Um, next question is about oh, Pam. Can can you pause on your questioning? Because both Chris and Rob have raised their hands, so they might have oh, further okay. answers to that. Yep. Chris and then Rob. So I wanted to point out that um, if something is a site plan review use, and it's already been approved by site plan review, and then there's some change to the facility, some change to the business that's in there, um, that can be approved by um, the administrative um, approval. And so um, one of the one of the reasons for avoiding the special permit is that um, the site plan review use can be approved by the building commissioner if there aren't any exterior um, changes. So that's an important aspect of um, what should I say, um, sort of streamlining things. Um, and the other thing is the ZBA special permit has a 20 day appeal period. So it automatically adds 20 days to the time in which it takes to get permanent. So those are two reasons why something <clears throat> would be better off in the site plan review arena rather than the special permit arena. Thank you. And Rob? So just adding to that and in response to um, why, why does it take so much longer to go through the special permit process? Um, because I see what happens is that when all of that, all those plans and all those documents are put together, 
that's about halfway for the applicant. That's when we then look at schedule to um, to uh, advertise for a zoning board hearing uh, four to six weeks generally. If they're not super busy, it's four to six weeks. After the hearing occurs, if it's done under in one hearing, sometimes it's two hearings. Once that's completed, it's another number of weeks before the decision is prepared. And then as Chris mentioned, uh, it's filed with the clerk and then another 20 day appeal period has to occur before um, be before we're able to proceed and issue permits for work to, to begin. So that that second half is uh, in, in the best case scenario is three months uh, yeah. to get through that process. And, and we've we feel like we've done so much work with the applicant, getting them ready for that that hearing process uh, and in what we've seen over the years is that uh, it's very well received by the board. And, uh, you know, uh, that's, that's why we lead to these, uh, these standards and conditions that really what the board have developed over all these years uh, and that we found that we've been able to, um, to implement on our own during the article 14, which was a great test for that. Great, thank you. Thank you, Rob. Pam. Further questions? Yeah, another quick one about, about the accessory uses. Um, trying to think how I how I asked myself the question as I was listening. Um, so is it possible for an accessory use of uh, outdoor dining or physics to be approved through the administrative process only? Or is or you know, if it's a, if it's deemed an administrative type process with with no changes or minor changes to the building, but they're but they're coming back and asking for an accessory use of outdoor dining or music. That's new. How how does that get treated? Nate or Rob or Chris. So yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you said if it's new, then. Um, you know, it's, it says it's permit. The accessory use would be new. Right. And so we're saying it's the same permitting as the principal use. So if it's site plan review or special permit, then it's a site plan review or special permit process. What if it's an administ what, what, what if it had been an administrative review? Would the accessory use doesn't count? That's that's not. Yeah. So, so like I said, so if there's a, already a site plan review, um, on a property and say the site plan review includes uh, outdoor dining or pre or live you know, recorded music, then that special, that site plan review or special permit still guides it. And so if there were changes in the new use or the new, say the new establishment was gonna continue to use that outdoor dining, then that could be an administrative approval because it's already under a permit. It's already under a site plan review permit. So it's not as if it needs a second site plan review permit, um, but you know what, what you know through the administrative approval process, we're writing in that there could be conditions. So if you know if there had been issues with how it was managed, then either it could be you know there could be conditions put on it, or it could be through a hearing process. It looks like Rob raised his hand. He might have a different answer. <laughs> Rob, well, just the way I understood the question, if, if there's an administrative approval granted for a restaurant. Uh, because there was no change to the site, no change to the exterior of the building, it met all those standards and was granted administrative approval with conditions. And then later on, they decide that they want to add outdoor dining and live music that would, in fact, be a change to the site that would be required to go through the site, the full uh, noticed site plan review hearing process, even for that little component. Uh, and it's possible that through that process, my administrative approval would be amended in some way uh, to, to be incorporated into that site plan review now that it's uh, got this exterior change occurring. Right. And thanks, Rob. But quickly, if, if that was already approved once and it changed, a restaurant changed hands, it wouldn't necessarily have to go through the hearing again, right? I mean, that's, that's how I explained it, if it was already approved once. It, right, so it's approved, it's constructed, there's this designated outdoor dining area that is built and not changed, but used by a different uh, operator, then that would be uh, um, appropriate for administrative approval. Great, thank you. I've got a couple little odds and ends, but I've taken up a lot of time. Thanks. We're going to go to Jennifer. 
Yeah, I just wanted um, to ask clarification on, so you said if a, um, if a restaurant was gonna become a bar and be open till 1130, then that would be an administrative approval. But I heard that, I guess I heard 1130 and what if it was gonna stay open after that? Would, would that trigger having to not, notify abutters? So what, you know, so the way it works now, existing, there's class one and class two. And so if it wants to stay open late, it has to get a special permit. So that's a, you know, it could initially, so what's happening is they initially come in as a class one site plan review, they get approved six months later, they want to change hours and serve alcohol later. They, there's a special permit process through the zoning board. Um, and then they're now a class two. What we're proposing is that um, if you're a restaurant or a bar with food, so a bar with a kitchen and you're serving food, you're by site plan review. If that same establishment though, then is like on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights, after nine o'clock, I'm gonna close my kitchen and just be a bar. Then they also are, there's two principal uses now in that space and they have to apply for a second permit, a uh, special permit as a bar with no food. And so, um, you know, essentially they would have to then get another permit, which is another hearing, another process. So it's not as if a restaurant could be operational and then um, you know, stop serving food, close their kitchen down, and then say they're still a restaurant, but serve alcohol. They're actually then, according to our proposed use categories, they're a bar with, you know. Right. No, I guess my question is um, just in terms of neighborhoods, like, okay, so where I live and it's just the way it is, nobody thinks twice about, we're just used to it, but they're, the bars close it to, there's a lot of pedestrian traffic in the residential neighborhood after that. So, but that's just the way it is. You know, it happens to be in this neighborhood. But I'm thinking of like North Amherst, could one of the restaurants become a bar open till two and the residents wouldn't be notified until it happens? You know, I'm trying to think of a place where people may be not going to their cars, not that you want anybody to go into really a car from a bar at two in the morning, but I'm thinking it like where the Moan and Dove is, there's probably less foot traffic from the establishment into the adjacent residential neighborhood, but in North Amherst, there might be. So I, I'm just trying to think of, would could people there find that an establishment they thought closed at nine or 11 was open till 2.30 and they didn't know it till it happened? Jennifer, I wanna try and rephrase it because I think I've got what you're trying to ask. Yeah. Right. I'm not good with all these articles. And <laughs> Which is, sections. can an, a restaurant open with hours to say 10.30, be a restaurant, serve food to 10.30, get their, spe their site plan review th through whatever, and then apply for just an, a change in hours. They already have a site plan review, and the only thing they're seeking to change on that is the hours from 11.30 to 2 a.m. Keep the restaurant, keep the kitchen open. Let's say they decide to pay their cook till 2 a.m. No, but what if they don't keep it open? Well, hold on, yeah, okay. but, but let me say, they're, they're yeah. trying, they'll pay their cook till 2 a.m. Would that change from 11.30 to 2 a.m. Right. be able to be approved under administrative approval or would they have to go back to site plan review? I, similar question for if it's just a bar till 11.30 and then they change to two. Right. It's an hour change like that administratively approved, approvable once they have a site plan review. So I would say it would be an administrative approval. So if, if a restaurant is open till 10 and then they want to stay open till midnight, you know, they still have the kitchen and everything, then that's an administrative approval. Chris? Sorry, I think it would need um, to go back through the land use permitting because presumably they have a site plan review that says what their hours of operation are and if their hours of operation are until 10 30 and they want to change that to be open until two i think that's a change in their land use permit but i will um I'll bow to rob if he has a different uh opinion on that rob uh i agree with chris so once we have a land use permit with conditions uh whether it's a special permit or a site plan review uh, you know, that generally we have a condition written into each of those decisions that says if there's any change that you shall come back to the board for review. Sometimes it's a public meeting, sometimes it's an amendment of the uh, decision. So that that would occur if there 
if the use originated with a written decision, land use permit decision. So Rob, just to clarify, so you think that change in hours would be enough to amend the permit, would need an amendment to the permit? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I have uh, just one concern, which is the one I brought up last time, and then just a question out of curiosity. My concern is still about the BN um, condition that remains in here about um, seating. And I'm not so much concerned about the maximum seating capacity of 30, but more of that 100 foot requirement of spacing um, that you said in your presentation might limit the ability to put a restaurant or a cafe in the BN neighborhood to only two parcels, um, which is very limited in my mind. Um, and almost, and, and so I, I guess I'm concerned about sort of, we're looking for more walkable neighborhoods within our zoning. We're looking for places that people can get to by walking to, by biking to and all. And if we're limiting where restaurants can go so strictly that we don't allow them within walking distance to certain neighborhoods because of these requirements of it has to be 100 feet and therefore you can't operate at all in most of the parcels. Are we going sort of against that walkability? Is there a smaller sort of distance that we could do that would still safeguard? I understand the concerns about, you know, timing and all, but um, you know, daytime hours are daytime hours. Um, could there be a limit be that that's provided more to protect residents that deals with hours of operation in those BN neighborhoods um, versus a distance requirement? Like, is the distance requirement the right thing to do to to you to to accomplish what I think the desired protection is, which is to ensure that the residential areas are not disrupted at um, in those small sort of areas at certain times of day. But maybe I'm interpreting what the protection is for, that 100 foot for protection. So I would just ask, what is that 100 foot protection meant for? And is that the right protection to accomplish the goal we're trying to accomplish there? And then just out of my curiosity, which is, um, what it, what would be the Drake under these new things? Because I know Rob's talked about we have no live music venue sort of permitting use. And so where would we think the Drake goes under our new zoning if we pass these? Which is just a curiosity of mine. Yeah, so I'm going to jump on that first one and let Rob talk about the Drake. I'm just going to share my screen quickly. The um, So yeah, the, the here's, um, if this is visible, um what's the hand here here's here's the bn here's the the the, the vfw here are the railroad tracks and these red lines are you know 100 feet from a residential house and so you know the bn encompasses what's just in this vertical uh, line so this property these properties here's uh, 446 and 462 main street which are being redeveloped with apartments and so you know the 100 foot buffer was meant to really be a, a, a spatial buffer from residential uses. Um, and so you can see what 100 feet looks like here. Um, you know, there's the BN uh, where Amherst Media's property is considered BN. You can see what 100 feet looks like from the adjacent property to the north. And then, you know, there's one BN property over here, uh, 319, 321 Main Street, and 100 feet from the homes. And so, you know, Mandy, to your point, could there be, um, another condition or criteria that could uh, help mitigate impacts possibly. Um, I also think that there's limited opportunity right now in the BN. <laughs> um, you know, this is all business village center right here um, on this on this section of Main Street. And so there's, you know, there's not many properties that are zoned BN, not to say that they couldn't change. Um, they couldn't change uses, but there's, there's not a lot. So, um, you know, Possibly staff, you know, staff didn't really want to, uh, originally was not to have anything, you know, maybe not to have that condition in there at all, but then there was some concern that the BN is, uh, you know, pretty integral to some residential neighborhoods. And so could there still be some, some conditions there specific to BN? And so if there's, you know, a different idea uh, that could work other than hundred feet, 
you know, could be size, hours of operation, um, then that could work as well. Chris? There's already a limit on the hours of operation in terms of serving alcohol, which is nine o'clock. So I think that's a pretty good limit. And that would already tamp down any kind of, um, you know, act activity that you didn't want. So what yeah, does that I, say? I guess that that sort of says, I'm not sure about the 100 feet. I, I guess I would follow up if Nate, you could put that back on, that, that map back on. That's sure. Because um, it was helpful to see those 100 foot barriers. So looking at the Amherst Media property, it how I look at that means that if I look at that sweep, it's likely that if Amherst Media, say, wanted to put a cafe in, they probably wouldn't be able to. Maybe in a small corner of the building, but I think the building's actually. It says building. Yeah, so the building, it's the exterior wall of the building that the use is in. So the building okay, itself. So so they literally could not put a cafe in if they wanted to, um, if we keep this condition. I look at the big building um, the, at that end, right, where your, where your thing is there. The entire buildings, you know, you can't put a building on that property pretty much more than 100 feet away. And so that building could never have a cafe in it. And then I look at where the Amherst dog wash and all is, which is across from Amherst Media. You pointed out that one. Um, that building, basically you can't put a building on that property that would comply with that. So that property is also negated from having any type of cafe on it. Um, even though across the street, basically are restaurants and cafes and food establishment areas. And so I guess if the concern is disruption to neighbors and residential buildings at night, the 100 foot barrier makes no sense to me and hours of operation condition would make more sense to me. Mm -hmm. uh, Pam. In a similar theme, I think given the fact that that all restaurants, most bars are now lumped into the same site plan review um, possibility that it's it's the same it's the same kind of basic dilemma and issue that um, all of the all except the BG, all of the business districts are in pretty close proximity to neighborhoods that are immediately adjacent to them. So if there is, um, although the 100 foot in this case seems a little restrictive because it means you really can't have even a coffee shop um, in, the, in the dog wash area or whatever, um, it's, it's, it's the combination of serving alcohol typically after night after eleven thirty at night and the and the distance to neighbors. Um, how do you how do you protect that if if in fact we're to approve this these sets of bylaw changes? How do you build in that? It's it's not just the discretion of of Rob when he goes to do an administrative change. That's only on on new uses, but um, you know what I mean. Anyway. Kind of the gist of my dilemma. Yeah, so I think, you know, this was a discussion at the planning board. You know, do we like the way it's written? You know, that was amended in two thousand one, or can we move away from that? And so, you know, what staff has said is that through Article fourteen in the last twenty years of permitting, that we can uh, get enough uh, information in the management plan and through the standards and conditions in the zoning bylaw that, you know, we can essentially set conditions to safeguard neighbors, um, right? So. I'll just share my screen again. What we're proposing in uh, in the you know table three are all these standards and conditions that need to be met. Uh, in the management plan, we have you know hours of operation, queuing, signage, lighting, noise containment, responses, you know strategies to screen and buffer adjacent properties from noise and other impacts, employee parking, and we could add, add to this list. You know there has been some suggestion to add um, about alcohol service, yeah. and so. You know what, what this does is a, an applicant has to answer how they're going to um, deal with all of these these categories and, ca and criteria, and then that becomes a condition as part of their permit, whether it's through site plan review or administrative approval. And so, you know, staff can see that a place may be pretty close to a residential neighborhood, and you know, 
the, the, the strategies for screening uh, noises from other property, and there can be a number of, of methods to that. And so that becomes a condition that they have to do that. And so, um, you know, it's, and, you know it, it's any use that could be close to a residential neighborhood. Uh, there could be some consideration as to how it's gonna be uh, mitigated or buffered. And so, um, you know, what we found is the ZBA has, like I said, their standard conditions and, you know, and it deals with that. And so that's why we're having these categories and the standards and conditions. So we think we can manage it this way as opposed to having, you know, 1130 end time or some of the current provisions in the bylaw, you know, we can handle it with these new uh, proposed standards and conditions. So I, I, I trust you. <laughs> um, that is, that is the key element that that neighbors would rely on you folks to take all of those elements into consideration. And um, whereas before there were some physical, there were some physical hurdles that they that they had to, you know, get around. Um, it, it's primarily the hours of operation, and it seems really benign to people who don't live near these these kinds of functions, but even, even, you know, in the fall, in the summer, definitely in the summer, even in the spring, when windows are open, there is conversation, there are doors slamming, there is, you know, there are motors running. And that's, you know, that's just part of their operation of business. But, but when it goes past 1130 at night, believe me, that's past a lot of people's bedtime. And that's when it becomes a burden that the neighborhood ends up having to bear. Um, so tell me, tell me how you're going to guarantee it. Uh, thank you, Pam. Rob. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to mention when we're talking about alcohol service, there's another level of review with the Board of License Commissioners. And they do establish and set the hours of operation. And you know, during Article 14, it's been interesting because um, Stephen McCarthy in our office, who supports the Board of License Commissioners, and I would talk about applications. And sometimes I'd have to wait to see what they wanted to do and establish for hours of operation so I can ensure that the Article 14 permit aligned with that. And you know, just for interest, there, there has there's been no new establishment that serves alcohol past 1 a.m. And that's that's continuing a practice that the zoning board of appeals has you know has seen through for many years, uh, stopping that. I think there were, are some pre-existing establishments that might operate a little bit later, uh, but uh, I just want to mention there's a management plan, business plan review, and a, a very thorough operational review by the board of license commissioners, which includes the hours of operation. Thank you, Rob. We're going to hear from Shalini and Jennifer, but then since it is a public hearing, we're going to move to the public part of the hearing to see if there's any questions and comments from the public. So Shalini. Um, what I'm hearing is that there are different pieces in place to make sure that when any approval is given, it's already taking into account the noise and nuisance to residents. Um, I was just curious, like in other towns that are similar, like, like are these very, I mean, I do hear from businesses, right, that there's too many steps and that's why we're doing this. And so the changes that are proposed, like how radical are they relative to other towns? Or are we just removing some of the obstacles and which will now make us comparable to other towns? So that was one general question. And the other thing I was like, which we will come to later when we do the rental registration is the idea of noise, especially when people are walking out from restaurants at night. And I wonder if we can deal with that through other mechanisms, like some of the suggestions that were there is like putting signage out on the streets, you know, like, can you, uh, no, you can't put signage out or you saying it doesn't work? Well, we'll discuss that, but just like- It doesn't work. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Like, I don't know if you've tried in a way that kind of brings a reminder, at least to some people, it may not work on everyone, but just having those reminders that, hey, this is an, you know, just a friendly reminder, you're in a neighborhood or something. Anyway, we'll discuss that in more detail, I'm sure. 
rental buy. Um, Nate or Rob or Chris, do you have a do you have any way to respond to the question about does this bring us more in line with other communities or is this sort of out of line with that, Rob? I think we still um, we are we are still I think regulating at a higher level than maybe some of those other communities for these types of uses even under the proposal. So um, it's not uncommon for other communities to just simply say a restaurant is yes in these districts where they've determined are appropriate for restaurants. Um, we also uh, are adding all this criteria. Uh, this, these standards and criteria that we're now proposing to write into the bylaw that don't exist today. So right now, uh, class one restaurants and even class two restaurants are not uh, guaranteed. I mean, these are, these are standards and conditions that we created and made part of an application process that we want to formalize. And that's really unusual to see that in, in bylaws uh, in, in the other communities. So I think it's still, still heavily regulated, in my opinion. Now, I was going to say quickly in terms of noise, I mean, there's the zoning bylaw and the land use permits, and then there's also the general bylaw. So, you know, there's a few different ways to address noise if it's on the street um, and outside the property. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, it may have to be complaint driven. But, you know, if if there's conditions, as I learned that, you know, hours of operation are, are strong enough in terms of a permit that that has if those change, that's a new permit hearing. But those hours are, are you know, are enforceable. The way they write into their management plan how they'll release patrons or manage the noise is also enforceable. And then, you know, if it's outside the property, then there's you know the general bylaw uh, that can be used for 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 that. Um, you know, it's really difficult to um, you know. The, I think noise is really interesting. You know, we heard from uh, a resident in North Amherst who said that you know the way noise moves around and can get into a house, even if it's not really loud, right? The din of it or the vibrations can, can you know, penetrate walls in a way that, you know, even if it's not a large decibel reading, it can impact. Um, that's true of anything. And so it's really hard to say, okay, what, what's the right, you know, what's the right, is it the time, is it the time of night or what is it that changes that? And so that's why in the management plan, we have all these standards and conditions to try to address it. But, um, you know, it's like, you know, my neighbor listens to music really early in his basement when he works out. And it's like, for whatever reason, that din of music, I, I hear it. My wife doesn't. And it's like, you know, <laughs> really? I mean, how is that possible from 100 feet away that I can hear some type of vibration, um, you know, on a second floor bedroom? But, um, you know, so I, I don't think that there's, you know, the noise piece is really interesting, right? I think that's a bigger question than the land use permit if it's outside the property and in the public right of way. It's not really something that zoning addresses directly, addresses it indirectly, but. And just make one more comment though, related to this is this, I just want us to keep in mind that it is hard for small businesses we're seeing to come to Amherst and sustain this in the economy and, and um, all the challenges that they've face and as we make it more and more difficult relative to other communities uh, i'm not saying we should be relaxed but as long as we have very good solid plans based on the past experience of our staff if they're taking all of that and distilling it into creating a very streamlined process that um allows that's inviting to businesses, that's what, and that's what we also want as a community is we want small cafes, local restaurants and so forth. So let's just keep that in mind. Yeah, Thank I just you. wanna say quickly to that, you know, Rob said that we're adding these standards and conditions to the bylaw, which is true. I think one nice thing about that, um, it's the same with article 16, we're putting in some extra stuff in terms of the FEMA, but what we're doing by putting it in the bylaw, we're making it up front. So not only do applicants see it, but property owners and landlords see it. And so what happens right now is a restaurant owner may, or you know, an applicant may come to town, see a space, uh, think they can open a restaurant in two weeks, and then realize they need architectural plans, they need permitting, and you know whether it's um, you know uh, just not enough education or misinformation or what you know they don't understand the process by actually having it in the bylaw. You know, someone could call the town months before they even really come and look at a space, and we could say, here's our bylaw. Here's everything you'll need. And it actually becomes helpful. You know, I see it as a checklist for a restaurant. And so we're providing them actually, to me, we're providing a great, great checklist with those standards and conditions. So by the time that they have to do any permitting or even come to town, they know what they need. 
They need a floor plan. They need to know how they're going to mitigate noise. Are they going to serve alcohol? Here's you have to go to the board of license commissioners. And so if it's not in the bylaw, you know, we'd probably develop a checklist internally, but by having it in the bylaw, it's something that, you know, is a regulatory and it's compulsive. And so that, you know, we can give it to landlords. There's no way a landlord wouldn't know about it because it's in the bylaw. So to me, it's actually a helpful tool um, as well. It's, you know, it's a regulatory tool, but it's also to me a helpful tool for businesses to be able to see it up front. Thank you, Jennifer, and then we're moving to the public. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to say, yeah, you know, anything that we can do to attract more businesses, you know, restaurants, cafes here, I think, you know, we all support. I live near downtown. I'd love to have more places to go walk to. So it's, I think the concern, but you hear us, is just that small category of establishments that are open very late at night. It's not a lot. And when we, where we are different than other towns is we, you know, have a lot of patrons that would go to those establishments late is just to be conscious that even if there's some noise control right at the establishment that it can filter out beyond that, you know, as, as people walk home. So I just, I, I know you know that, but that, that's, I think, you know, what we're, what, what the concern is that's being expressed. Thank you. We're gonna move, this is a public hearing, so we're gonna move under our public hearing guidelines to questions from the public. There are, is one attendee in the public right now. Um, so if you have any questions related to the food and drink establishment proposals um, that have been being discussed, please raise your hand at this time. There will be a separate, since this is a hearing, this is solely focused on this proposal and set of changes we've been doing. We will hold another public comment session during our meeting for general public comment, just to be clear. Um, so if you've got any questions related to this, please raise your hand at this time. Seeing no hands, if you have any comments um, related to this, these proposals, please raise your hand at this time. Seeing none, um, before we move to a motion, um, are there any other questions at this time from the committee or um, any comments the planning staff would like to make? Um, Pam. I would like to reiterate the desire to lower the capacity threshold uh, for the, the large facilities. Um, I had something lower in mind, but, but I understand that if, for instance, a Johnny's is um, is what 178 or something like that, and that there are several facilities that are about that same size or slightly larger. I would be okay with 200. Again, it's just sort of surprise, surprise. You know, site plan review only um, for something that that could probably generate a whole lot of, of car traffic, foot traffic, that kind of thing. So. Uh, would appreciate your consideration of that, as well as adding serves of alcohol to the uh, to the list of management conditions. Thank you. Um, can I make a another comment? I sure. I would love to hear from um, the planning board and just understand their final determination on this. I'm I'm wondering if it makes sense to um, extend the hearing continue it for feedback from them. Yeah, so so that was going to be my motion. Um, I was planning to move to continue the hearing. And before I actually make that motion, the reason I was going to make that motion was it sounds like there are potential other changes coming. And I would want us to be able to ask questions during a hearing about those quick changes instead of having the hearing closed. Um, and so, um, we are, I will say, I do have one concern. I'm hoping the planning board will be able to finish their hearing on the 16th. Um, we were hoping as a council and as a committee to get this to the council in time that the effective date would be as close to January 1 as possible. Um, to do that, we have to have our first reading at the first meeting in December. Um, and so, which is December 5th. So this, the hearing continuation to the next meetings in November is about as late as we can to still get it to 
first reading at the council. If it doesn't, it just means there's a lapse between Article 14 and when this goes into effect of a couple weeks, depending on when we get it. Um, but that that was my hope. But we've still, if we continue, we still have time to get it to the council by that December 5th council meeting. Um, so I'm going to now make the motion to continue this public hearing to November 17 at 4.30 p.m. Is there a second? Second. Jennifer seconds it. Any discussion? Seeing none, we're going to take a vote. Shalini. Yes. Uh, Pat. Aye. Mandy is an aye. Pam. Yes. And Jennifer? Aye. That is unanimous. Um, at 546, we've continued the hearing to November 17th at 4.30 p.m. I'd like to say thanks again to the staff for doing all this work and, and being patient with the questions. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all. We will see you in about two weeks and hopefully we'll have a, a knowledge about what the planning board has done and hopefully they'll have acted by then. Um, with that, we move on to action items. Action item A is not up for discussion right now because the hearing is still open. So that will show up on next week, next meeting's agenda. We're going to not take up action item B today because Pam, well, we're not going to take up the discussion. I will say Pam has sent out the emails we've been waiting for, and she has requested responses by this Saturday. And so we will put it on the next agenda um, is the plan. Um, but because we're still waiting with that deadline, I don't want to take it up today. Pam, you wanted to say something. You want just an update of how many people have said yes, they're still interested? Sure. OK. There are four people that have said that yes, they have a continued interest in, in being considered. And there are five people now that have replied, that have not replied. And there were several people that, that said clearly very, you know, no. So it's, it's um, we're hoping to hear back from the five people by the end of Saturday. Thank you for that. Um, so it'll be on next time's agenda, which brings us to action item 3C residential rental bylaw. The only thing we'll be dealing with is the one thing I added because of just time limits here, um, which is the discussion of the survey summary and analysis. So I want to welcome Elena back in and Shalini. Um, what we're going to do is let them talk a little bit about what they did and the, the document that is in the packet. Um, this is the survey analysis and summary from the um, engage Amherst sort of survey that we put out that had over 200 and I think you said 50 responses or nearly 250 responses. Um, and so um, there was some questions that I received about whether this is a final document or not. So um, could you talk about whether you're open to revisions and suggestions for revisions as you talk about this? Um, and we can as a committee discuss whether we would like to sort of take a vote at some point about finalizing this as the report for the survey or not. Um, it may not be necessary. It may be something the committee wants to do. Um, but yeah, so I'm just gonna turn it over for a little bit. We've got about 30 minutes to deal with this. So <laughs> um, Shalini and Elena, would you like to um, talk a little bit about what you did? And beyond, uh, one more thing to say, thank you so much. I know how much work this was. Um, thank you to both of you for putting in all of that time and doing all of this because without your desire to do that, I don't think we would have gotten the summary that we did get. We would have just had what we each read in our heads and then the charts that that was able to do. And I think what you've done is something that is a help to all of us, at least it was to me in terms of summarizing and bringing it all together to see really where the trends were. So. From me, I want to say thank you so much. Shalini and Elena. Thank you all for uh, giving us time to talk about this because I think the crux was that more than 250 people responded and they're still responding. We stopped at a certain point, October 7th, I think, which was uh, 257 responses. And I we felt that, I mean, I, I felt as CRC member that it's our responsibility that when we invite people to give us comments, that we do something with it and not selectively choose what we want and which happens right we bring our own lens so uh, I went to the UMass 
interns fair and met with Elena there and she immediately wrote back and it's been it was really so so fabulous to have Elena she was like a miracle worker with me working throughout um what we did is we took all the qualitative data of the four different stakeholders that we had um the tenants neighbors who are living close to uh, to in, in neighborhoods with rental units uh landlords and then landlords who are also neighbors and uh, we created a ta tags like we we went through over 400 pieces of information qualitative comments and um we tagged each one of them read the comments what were the key um, themes or ideas and we tagged them using existing tags that were already there in our surveys and then uh, elena did a lot of the tagging going through all of each comment and um, tagging them and each comment sometimes had multiple tags like this is concerning um, cost or um you know occupancy limits or so there were new newer top teams that were coming up that were not included in our questions in the survey so we found it very enlightening and then we took all of those comments and tried to collapse them into main themes uh, such as cost um um what are the what are the, Elena, what are the other <laughs> themes we have in the document um noise parking trash thank a you a bunch of different things yes and so and then so in the, so there's an executive summary up front uh which draws upon those main themes and the themes had quotes from the people and we what well, the other thing we tried to do is look at each issue from the lens three lenses of tenants neighbors and uh tenants neighbors and landlords so to not to really try to look at it from a very holistic perspective and one of the goals at least we felt and by the end of it is that we hope this document will create empathy for everyone who reads it to try and understand the different perspectives of the people who are living in our community and um and an understanding and respect so that's one of our goals i'm just going to pause for a little bit and it, elena add if if anything comes to mind that you want to add at this point? Um, nothing comes to mind immediately. I just had a really great time putting this together with Shalini. It was really great. Yeah, I think it was just so fabulous that we worked together. And also, I think it was really nice to have someone who experiences, has experiences in our town of renting and uh, being a college student, so I think that was really enlightening for me as well to have that perspective um, um, in doing this work. Um, so I'll just pause here if anyone has any comments or questions. And I think for, for us, at least it's like, how do we use this now to inform our discussions? I think that's one question for me. Uh, even though we've organized the executive summary to inform the goals that we have, and maybe that can, so when we're dealing with either the, uh, the um, not the bylaw, but what's the other document, the rel with the R, what's the word? Um, regulations. Regulations, yes. <laughs> so either it'll inform the regulations or the bylaw or, or even help the town staff and um, you know, in like seeing, okay, this is where people are concerned and so forth. Like some of the things that came up, I think that are relevant to staff might be the permitting process or, you know, like some of the things that we were just talking before, but there were those was from the landlord's point, it adds up to the cost every time we're adding more regulations and stuff. So that balancing of how do we have enough regulations that ensures the quality without making it burdensome because that does get passed on to tenants anyway that was one thing so thank you um thoughts comments questions um on i i'm going to open this up to not having too many limits on those thoughts comments and questions but um on how we could use it on how it's presented on anything you've got concerns with or questions you've got or requests for changes all of it it's it's just sort of open for 
all of that. Um, so Jennifer. Um, well, I guess for start, my first is whose report, is this a committee report? Is this a CRC report? So that's what we haven't decided yet, right? Um, we did the survey, right? And we've published almost all of the answers as separate answers. And Shalini wanted to have a report that does this. And so she took it upon herself and, and obtained a lot of help from Elena to do so. Um, but it was not a formal referral to say, Shalini from the committee, go do that, we're going to adopt it. So I think it's really up to the committee's discretion on and decision as to whether we want to formally adopt this as a committee report or whether we put this out there as a big thank you to Shalini for, for doing this itself. Um, so I'm open to thoughts on that. Okay. Well, so let's, I mean, um, so, you know, I have some, um, I don't agree with like just looking at the executive summary. I think, I don't know if you want to just get right into the discussion, but I wouldn't feel comfortable with this going out as it is, as a committee report or even as any kind of official report, because, you know, as with anything, you know, it, when people, I think, you know, take, they read the comments, it's, it's not objective. I'm just going to, I, I, I think conclusions were drawn. So whenever you're drawing conclusions, they're your con conclusions. So, you know, I don't know if you want me to just dive in. I know I'm a kind of a broken record on, but anyway, so that's just, my concern is, you know, what this report is, who's authored, where it's gonna go. Mm -hmm. um, you know, could, if we disagree, could we do our own report? You know, that. <laughs> Shalini. Yes. So, so there is a methodology in qualitative research where you tag things as they're coming up. So, and, and I've given links to the Google Docs, which have uh, like all the data that was uh, taken from the survey. It's all in an Excel sheet. And then you can look at the tags that were given. So it's not like we randomly chose to give a particular thing, a, one tag and then another one, another tag. So it was like, you can look at the data and see that, oh, I don't agree with this tag or I'd like to add additional tag. And that's totally fine because we did have limited time and limited staff to do this. It's just the two of us. So the process itself is like, I uh, come from, I have a PhD in, I don't want to throw my credentials, but that is my background is I do, I've taught PhDs how to do qualitative research, which is not a uh, subjective, like, oh, it's an opinion thing. There's actually a methodology to, I can send you these grounded theories or how you do research in that. That being said, this is not a final report that I'm attached to, but I welcome you all to look at the data and the tags that were given and if you'd like to change or add to some of the tags that's fine the other thing is that the summaries are of course that is i think the executive summary is more subjective in the sense of what so i would encourage you to look at the data which is um in terms of the themes right so the themes have these were the main themes of cost um and they have three columns in them and the columns have certain quotes that just to highlight. You know, I read the whole report. I read the whole thing. Yeah. Um, you know, and I read every survey that we got. But mm -hmm. when something goes out, you know, most many people will just read the executive summary. So okay. that's yeah, part I'm of the concern. Why? Yeah. Right. So if you'd like to uh, take because none of that is like all of the conclusions that are then the executive summary are tied back to the themes. Again, they were not like this is the data and here is the what we think the takeaways all the conclusions are tied back to the data so if you have very specific objections we're very open to discussions and if you'd like to edit it change it add your own we can definitely do it i think the important thing though is when we talk about community engagement we and we we put out a survey and we hear back from people, it is our duty to 
look at it in a systematic manner, discuss it as a committee, and then report back to them, this is what we heard and learned from you. So and I agree. And I mean, two things. First of all, in the executive summary, at one point, Rob is quoted from something he said at a forum. So it didn't seem appropriate since this is, the title is survey report. Okay. So there's some mixing up of what people say. Just that one comment, yes. Yeah, but that, but important, it's raising, it's trying to cast doubt on whether we can have occupancy limits, which is huge. So I have to say, when I read the executive summary, one of my main takeaways is that um, it says neighbors of rental, let's see, it's, it says that one of the major concerns, the occupancy limit is failing to support the bylaw goals of safe housing and strong neighborhoods in our town's comprehensive housing goals of providing affordable housing. The four tenant bylaw needs to be re-examined in zoning. So what I read in many, many of the neighbor, you know, the, the, the surveys mm -hmm. that were neighbor was that yeah. the concern with the occupancy limit was that it wasn't being enforced. Yes. Not that we shouldn't have an occupancy limit, but when you read the executive summary, you come away thinking, oh, you know, people aren't really happy having an occupancy limit. And that, that is not at all what I read. Okay, one minute. Okay, let's just take a <laughs> Um, If you look at the table with the occupancy limits, I do give the perspectives of all three. And you're absolutely right. For the neighbors, it pre presents almost the opposite. Uh, so why isn't that in the executive summary? Maybe. Why is the opposite in the executive summary? I mean, if, you're, if we're trying to show balance, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I, my feeling, let me take a look at what I wrote over there. Okay, hold on, hold on. Yeah. So, so we're going to give Shalini some time to take right. a look at so that. Right, so I'll stop is, for now. Yeah, it, it is one thing. Thank you for bringing up that concern, Jennifer. Um, yeah. oh, we're going to go to, we'll, just, we'll let Shalini, hold on, we'll let Shalini respond, then we're going to go to Pam. One thing I'm, I'm hearing, though, is, um, what we can do after bringing some of these up is each of us could send Shalini some comments for her to take into account in revising a potential report um, and, okay. a, and, and a document. Okay. So Shalini, would you like to respond yes, after we're yes, doing that or do you need more time? No, I found it. Okay. So it says number five so that we can all be on the same page. Number five point in the executive summary is key factors concerning occupancy limits. And it clearly has the title negative consequences for tenants, negative consequences for neighbors. Neighbors of rental properties complained about the noise and chaos from too many people living in tight quarters, cars in diminishing property value. So it does reflect the neighbor's point of view. The next paragraph, however, says the way it stands now, the occupancy limit is not serving the tenants or the neighbors. That's not a true statement. You can edit it. I mean, I not think a true statement. It is not a true statement because the occupancy limit is. If you say it's not serving the neighbors, it's not because it is not being enforced. Mm -hmm. That that is that doesn't mean it needs to be changed. It just simply means it's not being enforced. But this doesn't say that in a in a nice way. It doesn't say that. Okay, I, the same comment that that Jennifer did. Okay, so the reasoning for that is that um, right now, the way it stands, A, there is a problem in impl implementation, so we can include that and say that more clearly if that would be helpful. The second thing is in some cases, maybe four is even too much because of the proximity and whatnot. Maybe in some cases it needs to be reduced to three. So we, I don't think we're trying to say to increase the occupancy to six, all it's saying is there needs to be a discussion. It's not saying we should increase it to eight or 10 or six. It's only saying that um, it needs to be reassessed. And if there are, ed yeah, I, I, I see. Let mm -hmm. me finish this sentence. If there are edits that you would like that you think would convey that more clearly, definitely send me the. Okay. Thank you, Shalini. Pam, Pam. Yeah, I, um, I just, I had my own question, but just to follow up on that a little bit, um, it doesn't say in the survey that, that, 
the occupancy limit is failing the by bylaw goals. I mean, that is that is an extraction of some comments about the occupancy limit that is being brought into this summary, which I think is is it's stretching the bounds of um, of this survey tool. Let's just put it that way. So I had a couple comments, and I really really appreciate all of the, all of the time using this. Um, there was an an area that had eight. It was like um, eight elements that you listed that were very clear. Um, can't remember where it is now. Oh, yeah, it's on page 10. And it was as you got into the qualitative analysis, costs related to rents, quality of housing, noise, parking, complaint process, relationships, for tenant limit, and other perspectives, which were really great categories. I, I expected to see those um, at the beginning, you know, essentially the same categories. And instead we have um, licensing fee, licensing program, fine complaint. So it's a different, it's a whole different ball of, of um, material that's trying to be processed. So it, it was hard for me to follow the organization of that, okay? The other thing that, that I would like very much to ask for is that we could say key insights or themes, but I would like to very much ask to have the word recommendations stripped out of this entire thing because none of us is yet making a, re a recommendation. And if, if someone in the public reads this and says, oh, CRC or even this report is recommending something, I wanna have to agree to it before, <laughs> before it goes out. If that uh, if that works for you folks, um, just very generally, um, again, like item number one, key factors impacting the licensing and licensing fee. But then below is licensing fee and fines, and to me, those are two very different categories that that probably should be treated separately. Um, again, uh, number two their licensing program plus complaints. And again, those are those are two different things that, that we ought to get separated out. So just for reference, Pam, you are on um, like, in the executive summary. It doesn't quite have a page number on it, but it's it's in the executive summary numbers yes. one and two under key insights for people trying to find it. I'm sorry. Yes, absolutely. It's page three of 29, two and two and three of 29. And again, um, where the the follow up, the sort of a follow up summary of each of these items, um, considerations for is a really good phrase in number in number one. Um, so that's on, it's the second paragraph under key factors impacting license fee. Considerations for that emerged from the survey. That's a really good phrase rather than recommendations. I love that phrase. Um, so that's sort of the, the theme of, of what I'm reacting to is that um, we aren't making any recommendations, nor did I think there were any, there were lots of suggestions, but no recommendations, if that makes sense. Thank you. Um, Shalini. Um, the way, I think this is just like a starting thing. So it wasn't meant to be like a final that I'm speaking on behalf of all of you. I just did all of this work on behalf of all of us. So it wasn't like I did it as with a personal goal of something, something. It was just that this all this data was out there and I wanted to do something about it. And I think we talked about it in CRC that I would be doing it. Uh, that being said, we can get rid of the whole executive summary if you want and just keep uh, the themes that are there later on that you like in the qualitative, you know, in starting in on page 10, because that is kind of how the, the, um, I just took a shot at taking, if you look at, so page 10 has the summary, um, the main themes, and then if you go on to 
page uh, 14 of the qualitative analysis. And it says, okay, these are the main themes that came through. And then each of those themes has, uh, is based on, uh, it, it draws the main themes for the tenants, the neighbors and landlords. And then there's some quotes, not all of them, of course, but there's some quotes to kind of highlight what was the essence of what people were saying from all three perspectives, right? So we try to be really balanced and bring that idea that any issue we look at, let's try and look at it from multi-stakeholder yeah. perspective. And so we could just take that as a starting point. I just took a stab that, okay, now that we have these themes, how can they inform our goals? So that's what I was trying to do is take all of this and take a higher level of abstraction and say, okay, the cost, or like when we hear that landlords have permitting fees or it's affecting the tenants, rents, maybe these insights can go to inform when we have a conversation about um, setting the fees for tenants, the different types of tenants that we heard, like we heard from landlords, like, and, and from tenants that when they're living with their landlords or when they are single family homes, those prop, uh, with the landlords living there or close by, there are no, there are very little challenges. In fact, they're mutually beneficial relationships. So it seems like, and that obviously that's me projecting that it sounds like that needs a different kind of fee that we charge from the larger units. So that was just me taking a stab at initiating that conversation, but it's by in no means the final, um, conclusions, but it's just to get us thinking about how to use um, these main themes that emerge in the qualitative data, starting from page 14, and how can we use that to inform now um, uh, our rental registration bylaw discussions. So I'm totally happy to change the executive if you all want different themes to come out of that. Maybe you will look at it and say, hey, this also informs, you know, X, Y, Z. So definitely let's do that, but let's use the data. Let's really see what people were saying and let's see how it can inform us because I certainly learned a lot of new things when I really looked at it from all three. I'm like, whoa, you know, there's a lot going on. Okay. Thank you, Shalini. Um, so I, I wanna say, I would love to keep the executive summary, maybe based on some comments it needs looked at a little more closely in terms of things, but that that part, you know, really helped me in terms of looking at this. And one of the things I just want to say, some of the surprising things I thought in reading this, one of which was we went into this survey asking about rental housing in hopes that it would inform our bylaw work on rental permitting. And when you look at the executive summary and when you look at all of the also additional work beyond the executive summary that was done in this, there's a lot more than just permitting that it might inform us for. Um, and, you know, really eye-opening on just other areas that, that we might not and probably can't use for the rental permitting discussions, but that we're gonna be able to use um, for other parts of our work, I think, as CRC members and maybe as counselors going forward. Um, and the, uh, the other thing I wanna say is, you know, when they were coming in one by one, I knew we were getting a lot of people in the 18 to 29 area, but I had not realized how many we were. And when I saw that 26% of all respondents were in that age range, um, I it, it almost floored me in, in how well of a response we got, which um, I, I want to actually thank all of the um, cooperation we had from Rob's department in emailing landlords and tenants about the survey from UMass in emailing off-campus student housing about the survey. I, I feel like in my four years on the council, this was one of the first times we've really had engagement from a sector of this community that we've struggled to engage in. Um, and so, you know, I think that's really important to acknowledge that engagement and then use that engagement for something to inform us on what we do afterward, as well as the engage, you know, that was 25%, 75% aren't in that category, right? 200, and I, I never thought we'd get 250 responses and more, never. <laughs> and so I, I, I think 
it would be wonderful if we could figure out a way to use Shalini's work um, and Elena's work to make something of a sort of report and formalize this as a CRC group if we can get to that point, um, because I do think it's really important what Shalini said about um, reporting back out, you know, not expecting everyone to read all 250 responses to see what it was, saying here's a 29 page document that summarizes where you can get an idea of what we heard um, and then use it going forward for other things. So, you know, those are some of my initial thoughts and just views. Um, Pam. Thanks. I really liked um, page nine of 29, which gave a background. And it felt like if, if in fact this was going to be a report that goes out, that's a really important thing to have up front. And um, by the time I had gotten to page nine or 10, it was like, oh, okay, yeah, that because I think there was a reference to the goals for doing the, the bylaw reform. And it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, here were the goals. Having them up front would be great, I think. So that was a, that was a really good page to, um, but I think needs a little more, a little more prominence. Thank you, Pam. Jennifer. Uh, you're still muted. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I think there, well, I actually, first, I did have a question in terms of the demographics of who completed it. Was there really zero between 30 and 50? No, there wasn't. Because I remember reading some surveys that were from people who were in their 40s. I guess where it said, um, was it page two at the top? Yeah, it had respondents 18 to 29, and then it went to 50 to 59, 60 to 69, 70 to 79, and there was like from 30 to 49 was missing. Yeah, I, I can answer that in terms okay. of that, that sentence is talking about the largest groups of respondents and their age ranges and in order of what percentage is in those. So she, she highlighted the largest. Order. Okay, so there were, but it's still interesting that kind of the, how do you put it? Certainly the people in sort of raising children years seem to be, so I don't know if that's because that's the demographic we're losing in Amherst. So I, that was really food for thought for me, but that's just an aside. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I um, appreciate the survey being done, you know, which we have to thank Shalini for, you know, just because you worked on this survey, right? You And Mandy Joe. Okay, well, yes, that was a huge lift and having all the data and having it compiled. So I, I mean, hugely appreciative of that, we all are. But I do, I would, if we're gonna, I, I think we should have an executive summary, but I think that we need to, because I feel since we, we respecting all, all the pe many people that completed a survey, I, and I know I'm a broken record on this point, but I do feel like on page four, that under the heading negative consequences of, for neighbors of rental properties, I am concerned that the, you know, the neighbors that completed it will feel that their concerns may be misrepresented in some of what's in those paragraphs. So I, I would want to be able to, you know, do that. Thank you. Not, um, not me personally, but the committee. I, I recommend um, that, you know, if you've got specific changes you'd like to see, please send them on to Shalini. Um, she can bring, based on the conversation we've had today and things that were mentioned, a, a new draft to a future um, meeting. I'm not sure which meeting yet, Shalini, so I'm thinking after Thanksgiving. Um, we've got something now we can work with to inform us even if we don't finalize it immediately type things. Um, but that, and then I just have a question. But I don't think it should be circulated. I mean, is there, does the committee have any state, you know, until? So it has, it is in our packet. I have not included it and sent it to the town council yet, but it is in today's packet. So anyone who wants to see this one can see it um, along with the discussion that we've had today. Um, but I have not, if, if, if it makes sense to say reported this out to the council yet, 
um, in there was in a um, I think I referenced something in a, in something that will be in the council packet on Monday, but I have not included this. I think Shalini might have requested it be in Monday's packet from Athena. I don't know whether she put it in. If CRC is uncomfortable with that, we can request that it be removed from that packet for later dates um, after today's discussion. Um, but uh, Shalini and Elena, just any questions, any further questions? comments um and or anything else you want to hear from us or thoughts shalini um i would love to get your edits and so i can share it and if i don't get it i think i will be sharing it with our district uh with my district five people but i will put it out as my work i will be very and i can put a statement saying that this is not endorsed like we're still discussing it and this is but i have put in like hundreds of hours into it as long as i'm not saying it's coming from you all like i did this work and i think i have a right to share it with the public yes you do thank you uh, I, Pam. I i appreciate that and i appreciate pat's support of that i think what is what's hard about this is that in fact you are drawing many conclusions that we as a committee just have not drawn and once something is public, you can never, it's like a word spoken, you can never take it back. And I, and I don't want people pointing to um, conclusions that, that are not supported by just data points. It, it, you know, recommending that we, that, that, you know, the, the cap on four people should become a, you know, a, a zoning discussion that really, the word zoning, I don't think even shows up in the whole, any of the, the respondents and maybe Elena, you know, can, can prove me wrong, but um, it's, it could be incendiary. Let's put it that way. I think yeah, that's it's, what I'm, it's I'm not concerned about that. safe to put something out with recommendations and conclusions. I just, I would just ask you to really, really, really reconsider doing that until perhaps the CRC has has um what's the word um consensus has some consensus on it thank, thank you Pam. Pat it seems to me that uh Chalene should be able to share her work it's her work uh particularly with her district I could see us saying don't share the executive summary but her conclusions about it, I think it would be shared. That's what's happening. If Jennifer were bringing it to your, you know, district three, or, then you'd be sharing your conclusions from it. But I do agree that the executive summary has to be created by all of us. Um, I'm really grateful for this work. And I just want to remind us that what you see as incendiary You have your truth and what you want to see and what facts you want to glean from this, just like I have my truth and the facts I want to glean from this. Somehow or other, I need all of us to really think about the whole of Amherst and what we're doing and not to put out misconceptions and things like that about occupancy limits, which you two have done. So what you want from Chalonet, I would like to have from you as well. And that feels very important to me. Thank you, Pat. Jennifer. I think when what if I'm understanding correctly that when Pam said that, she's saying for all the I didn't complete a survey. So it's not that I feel misinterpreted, but for the 38% in all the neighbor surveys, I didn't hear anybody saying that there was a problem with having occupancy limits. When occupancy limits were mentioned, it was a concern that they weren't being enforced. So I think that's what Pam was saying, that all the people who completed a survey and, and then are going to read, you know, if they read the executive summary, they'll say, wait a minute, who well, you know, that's why I agree with you about the executive summary being held back by Chalonet. Okay, I agree, I agree with you. With not not I'm anything not else. I agree. That. But I agree. I'm also questioning the kind of information that 
different counselors have put out to their districts, depending on their interpretation and what they want and what they think their district wants to hear. So I guess I'm asking for all of us to stop that. Well, no, but we're here to represent our constituents. Yeah, but not by fibbing. Who's so, fibbing? So, oh, wait, wait, you, I, oh my goodness. Jennifer and Pat, <laughs> I want us to take a step back. Um, Let's take a step back um, and, and just stay calm. <laughs> Although not saying that doesn't always help at all. <laughs> I will admit that. Um, you went to the same training I did. Step back and and just just say that that uh, uh, what I what I want to say is as chair, it is clear this committee has very different views, particularly surrounding occupancy limits. We've struggled with it for the past nine months in any conversation we've had, and so that is the one issue I've I'm seeing in this particular executive summary that has been brought up as as the most sort of in conflict within ourselves. Um, and so we might have to take a step back from that one in and of itself. We're almost out of time on this meeting, but I know I'm, I'm gonna recognize more people. We're going to, it is clear from this conversation, we're going to have to put this on an agenda again, if we want to try and be able to get to something where we can put out a report as a committee on this, um, which I personally, and as chair, I think would be, something that would be helpful to all um, to be able to say here's what we saw this is this is the you don't have to read 250 responses here's what we got and here's a summary um, so let's take a step back from that Shalini and Elena if they have time we'll go back and take some of the comments we've heard and try and do stuff um, she, Shalini was working really hard and Elena were working really hard to be able to get it out in time for us to have the conversation today to start. Um, and so, you know, I, I appreciate all of that work and, and the rush that went into trying to meet today's deadline, which means some of this may have ended up that way. But Shalini and then Pam, and then I'd like to move on to public comment um, as part of our meeting because we are almost out of time for our meeting. Okay. So the question whether the resident uh, whether the survey talked about changing the occupancy limit if you read page 24 where it says stakeholder perspectives on the four tenants rule under tenants under neighbors under landlords there are quotes taken directly from the survey and it does say from tenants point of view saying rather than having a law of four unrelated and what there should be a limit based on the size and zoning of the property so that the landlord cannot place additional units abutting your home the second person said as a college student the four person bylaw seems very outdated and pointless because this person can't live together with their girlfriend and whatnot another person said that the ten that the landlords sometimes misuse this limit to stop prevent uh, tenants from complaining because there are more tenants already living and then they'll use that to so it's being used in very bad ways from the tenants point of view from the residency i really as a that's the integrity that any researcher brings to a project is to reflect all perspectives as fairly as possible. From the neighbor's point of view, I did include in their comments, which is so for students, there's more density and it creates more, you know, re reduces the uh, property um, income, you know, rates. And so I tried to project all three and it's, I'm not pushing in any agenda, but I want what it seems like from this, this particular, there are other comments too that we need to discuss, but with this, it does, require us to reassess and have that conversation. The second thing I just want to say is, in my opinion, I thought I reflected in the executive summary that this was a negative aspects for the residents, this was a negative for the, but if, you, if, if it's not clear in having that one statement that they did not find the implementation of it appropriate, I am very happy to make that clearer because again i wanted to be an accurate reflection and all the conclusions in the executive summary are tied to the data points nothing was a priori projected which we have seen in the past a lot of reports that have been presented 
to town council have an agenda they do research and they come back and say oh this is what we found there's no connection between the data and and so we really tried to do a very thorough job with the limited time we have to show the connection but i'm like i said this is an initial step taken and i would very much welcome that being said I will be sending this out. I will remove, I'll make all the changes and I'll also not say recommendations, but considerations. All the, everything that we heard today, we will change that. And um, I will be sending this out. I can remove the executive summary if that's uncomfortable to people, but I do want to let the tenants and our district people know that everything that you said, we are listening and um, this is the work I have done and it's been taken to the CRC and we're going to be discussing it. Thank you, Shalini. Pam, then Jennifer, and then we're moving to public comment. A, a quick, a quick note on the. It reminded me of the forum information. So I have, I have eight pages of notes that I took from the forum, and I'm sort of thinking, okay, how do we, how do we take advantage of all that input that we got? Um, so far, we have not incorporated it, and I saw that's why we, we, we sort of focused on. I focused on seeing Rob's name and his comment from a previous work session, I knew was not part of the, the survey. Um, so that was one thing is, is um, you've already taken on this huge task, but how do, we, how do we use the forum information? And then secondly, I wanted to say to Pat, I do not talk about zoning with my district. So I have not shared anything about this with my district specifically. I don't talk about limits to my district. I talk about it with my friends, but I don't talk about it with my district. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Jennifer. Okay, I do talk about limits with my district because it is a huge issue in my district. It has been for decades. So yes, you can barely go, you know, you can't go out to dinner in my district without it coming up. Um, but yes, I, I would feel it's, yeah, it's the executive. If, I would feel more comfortable with the executive summary until we've all had input, but the rest of the document, yeah, you know, um, you know, it's more raw data. And, um, I, you know, I also did have the concern with if it was a, um, a summary of the surveys, that with all due respect to Rob, that a comment made during the forum probably didn't um, belong in the executive summary, but so, um, yeah, without the executive summary, I think it seems nobody has any concern or objection. Thank you. Shalini, we really do have to move on. Um, yes, sir. But thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, at this time, we're going to move on to public comments. So public comments with, on matters within the jurisdiction of CRC are going to be accepted at this time. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes. Please, if you would like to make a public comment at this time, please raise your hand and we will recognize you in turn. Seeing no hands, the public comment period is closed. Um, with that, we're going to move on to minutes. Um, we have Elena, if she wants to oh. say anything and then she would be good. Yeah. yeah. Yes, no, thank you. <laughs> Elena, would you like to say anything else? I do really thank you for coming. Um, if we, when this goes back on an agenda, if you're available, um, I'm hoping Shalini will remind me if I don't remind, remember myself to invite you again, if you're available for continued discussion on this because of all the work you've done on it. I think it's important for you to be included. Um, anything you'd like to say? Yeah, definitely. Um, thank you guys so much for looking this over. Um, despite issues with the executive summary, I think all the data afterwards is really important and um, things that have affected me and a lot of people that I know personally, especially in the community. Um, so thank you for taking the time to look at it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much and thank you for coming thank today. You. Um, minutes. We have three sets of minutes to approve today. Um, the October 13th minutes, the October 24th minutes, and the October 27th minutes. I believe, Pam, you have some amendments to the October 24th minutes. Would you like to uh, summarize those amendments? Uh, you're, you're muted, Pam. Sure. I don't have them in front of me, but I, I recall that um, the Diwali date was wrong, and or the time of um, uh, the time of the celebration was was incorrect, 
And then I also think that this was the meeting that I chaired and so, or, or vice versa. And so your name was where my name should have been. That's all I can remember. I just pulled up what you sent me. My your name was there when it should have been mine because I chaired this one. Um, so so that that was one correction. And then looking at the other ones um, that you had, I'm I'm going through quickly here. I know you mentioned the Diwali either date or time. Um, I don't see it on here immediately. Um, should have been under announcement somewhere, but I believe those were the two changes. In the October 24th one, the dates of the Valley are wrong. Yeah, so that's the other change is the, the dates um, to the Valley. Yeah, the date and time. So I've made a comment on this thing itself. That's it's a small thing, but just in case anyone did yeah, see yeah. and happen to be yeah. wanting to come to Diwali, then yeah, it is November 5th, 330 to 6. Yeah. Okay. So are there any other changes to any of the other sets of minutes? Seeing none, I'm going to make the motion to adopt the October 13th, 2022 minutes as presented, the October 24th, 2022 special meeting minutes as revised and the October 27th, 2022 meeting minutes as presented. Is there a second? Second, DeAngelis. Thank you, Pat. Any further discussion? Seeing none, we start with Pat. Aye. Uh, Mandy is an aye. Pam. Aye. Jennifer. Aye. Um, and Shalini. Yes. That is unanimous for those three sets of minutes. Um, I don't have any announcements. Does anyone else have any announcements? Next agenda is going to include the food and drink establishments, um, uh, associate member vacancies, and we'll put residential rental bylaw on there. It will not be to give Shalini and some time. It will not be this summary and analysis. It will be going back towards the bylaw and regulations itself. Um, I'll try to get you more information as to which of those three we'll be working on and discussing more specifically so that we can all focus our concentration on one thing once I determine and once I think through which we need to start our conversation with. Um, so that's my next agenda preview. Shalini, you have something? I was just going to say, I encourage people to just look at the data part of it, because even as we're having the discussions to see what were the comments and if they tie or relate to the things that we will be discussing in the in our rental registration. Thank you. Are there any items not anticipated? Seeing none, thank you so much. Thank you, Athena and Rob and Dave and all for not just attending, but staying a little bit afterward. We are adjourned at 6.38 p.m. Thank you, everybody.